this prayer brings us to God's provision for our needs. In fact, it's all about God. It begins with giving him glory. And then it's, there's three basic petitions. Give us, Lord, we're in need. Give us. Okay? And by the way, isn't it great? Isn't he, it kind of a good deal, like, for instance, like with, with tithing? He doesn't say give 90% and I'll let you keep 10. I'm giving you 10%. That would still be a good deal for us. Amen? He says you can keep 90 and give 10. Actually, it was over 20-some percent in the Old Testament. And 10% was to the Levitical priesthood, which was the ministry. So that's why we use that percent a lot, because that's a picture of ministry in the New Covenant. And how much more are we indebted to the Lord in the New Covenant? But I'll tell you, isn't it interesting when we say give us, really God is the one that gives us everything we have. He says he owns a cattle on a thousand hills, you know. It's all about him. So we do petition him. We say give us this day our daily bread. So it's give us, it's uh, forgive us. We need forgiveness, amen because we're sinful creatures that have fallen radically short of God's glory, and we need his mercy and forgiveness. Otherwise, his judgment would of necessity come upon us because of our due, due deserts. So we say, give us. We say, forgive us. And now we say, deliver us. We're at that part of the prayer where we're praying, deliver us. And that's in uh, Matthew chapter 6. Pray then in this way, says Jesus, our Father who is in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And then 14, he begins, to, verse 14 begins to talk about that prayer. We already covered verse 14. So I just want to look at verse 13 today. And I want to just have one message on it. Because at the men's retreat, we had uh, messages on temptation. We had messages. Roger's message was a beautiful message with a lot of scriptures on temptation and how to overcome it. The message I gave was on Samson and Delilah, which all had, so dealt strongly with the component of uh, temptation. Uh, the second message I did on Samson and Delilah showed Samson as a type or picture, a uh, pretty in-depth picture of Jesus Christ. And you can get those messages, and really, I think that will bless your heart because you'll You'll glorify Jesus in the picture, but you also deal with two messages on temptation plus this one. So I didn't want to, since there's three messages available that have been done of recent times on temptation, I didn't feel I needed to do oh, several messages on temptation. And specifically here, Jesus is dealing with praying in regard to temptation. So really this verse, to exposit, has to do with praying about leading us not into temptation, so it's really, and we could go off and talk about temptation for weeks and weeks, or we can hone in today on this principle uh, of praying, because that's that part of the prayer, and do not lead us into temptation, but deliver us from evil. I mentioned there's seven components of this prayer, seven petitions, so to speak, and uh, the last two, six and seven, are and lead us not into temptation, and number seven but deliver us from evil. You could put six and seven together as one, actually, or you can see them as different aspects uh, of you know, the same uh, principle, but I do see different aspects there. There's shades of differences there. Now, it's important to understand that we all battle with temptation. We all battle with temptation. Uh, the Greek word there in the Greek, New Testament was written in Greek, and the Greek word is parasmos, parasmos. And uh, parasmos is a very interesting Greek word. It can be translated tempting or tempt or temptation, you see. Uh, there's perazo, which, you know, and there's parasmos. The noun, parasmos, and the, the verb, uh, perazo, uh, meaning it forms the same word. And it's a hard word to tempt because we don't have an English word uh, that is understood like they understood this word in the Greek. Because the word in Greek was actually very neutral. It was a word that was morally neutral. It didn't always mean to be tempted. It, it all, often means to be tested. It could mean to be tested without the thought of temptation really entering your mind, or it could be used in the context of being tempted without the concept of being of tested being in your mind. Biblically, it's used with both concepts in mind, typically. Now, and that's why you can translate this verse and lead us not into testing as well as temptation, because the same word is translated te testing several places in the New Testament. But you see, scholars, when they translate Greek words are trying to look for context. They're not just looking at syntax and they're looking at grammar. They're also looking at, at context. And the context seems to be temptation here. 
But what's interesting is many scholars, too, because it, it, it brings a problem. It brings us into a dilemma when we try to understand this word as temptation. So some scholars say, well, it should be probably test, translated tempted there. Or, I'm sorry, tested there. And we're going to look at that because it's a... But you translate it tested, it creates a whole other dilemma. So we need to actually look at this verse. And I love the puzzles in the scripture when they're posed to us, especially the ones that aren't so apparent and also the ones that are very apparent because when you see how the puzzle is solved and a light goes on, you grow in your walk and you appreciate the scripture even more. And I haven't really set out to what the puzzle is in, in any kind of depth at this point, but we need to understand that temptation is solicitation or seduction to do evil. Temptation is solicitation or seduction to do evil, to do that which is contrary to the moral law of our Creator, the law of love that glorifies Him and loving, your, loving God with your whole heart, soul, mind, strength, loving your neighbor as yourself. A violation of that moral law in not loving God, committing some kind of crime or sinful act, some kind of evil that is not loving your neighbor, is sin and so temptation is solicitation or seduction to go in that direction, to commit sin. We're faced with a bunch of choices in life. Life is a series of choices that you make for either good or evil, to be a blessing or to be a curse. In fact, the scriptures tell us in Deuteronomy chapter 30, verse 19, it says very clearly that, you know, the Lord says that, just, you know, he says that I call heaven and earth to witness against you this day. He says, I put before you life and prosperity. Two choices. I put before you life and prosperity and death and adversity. I put before you life and prosperity and death and adversity. And then he says, choose life that you and your descendants may live. Choose life. So God's put before us in the world that we live in. We do have all kinds of things before us and God's calling us to choose life. In the Garden of Eden, he told Eve not to partake of the tree of knowledge of good and evil. And he gave her all the other trees in the garden, which were awesome. Even the tree of life was there. The one tree she wasn't supposed to partake of was what Satan used to bring the fall of humanity. And while she fell, when Adam ate after her, that plunged the whole human race. Adam's sin plunged the whole human race because he was the federal head of the race into, ascent, into depravity into a fallen state. We now have these fallen natures. Humanity is depraved. I mean, just read the news. That's why you have to lock your doors at night. That's why you have to watch where kids are playing and who's talking to them, because we live in a wicked, fallen world. And so Satan uses that fallenness of the human flesh, and he incites people to sin and to rebel against God. But the interesting thing about temptation is that Satan appeals to two different things in people. He appeals to the baser side of their nature, their fallen, baser instincts, the instincts that God did not create us with, that we turned from him and we've inherited a fallen, sinful nature. But he also appeals to idealism. You see, he doesn't come up to people and says, hey, why don't you do this so you can ruin your life and burn in hell forever? That's not how Satan pitches his work, is it? They say, hey, come on, sin, man, so you can just destroy yourself and destroy your family and destroy whatever is around you, and so you can fry in hell forever. That's not how he deceives people. He does it with idealism. You know, he does it with, hey, Judas, 30 pieces of silver here, you know. Jesus is, you know, the leaders are turning against him anyways. Might as well capitalize on it, you know, or it might be with David and, and, and beautiful Bathsheba. He doesn't say, hey, David, you're going to ruin your life. You're going to ruin, hurt the lives of your children through this sexual sin. He says, hey, look what you get here. But there's something really insidious about it, and it doesn't bring uh, the, the, the you know, offer that Satan promises people. Or it might be as simple as the fruit you know, that looks good to the eyes, and it, Satan promises will make her wise and make her as God. And really, she was very unwise, and she ended up dying spiritually, and she didn't become a God. And Satan uses those lies, as you know, in the New Age movement today, the same lies. You can become God you know, and it's all about you, and, you know, the God out there is really us, it's an impersonal force, and we're really God, and he's a little more sophistication, but the same lies, and it's interesting because the scriptures tell us things like stand firm, resist evil, uh, Ephesians chapter 6, 10 through 18, regarding putting on the armor of God, 
1 Thessalonians 5, chapter 5, verse 22, talks about abstain from every form of evil, you see. Uh, 2 Timothy 2, 22 talks about, says flee youthful lust. We're called to deal with temptation by fleeing it, by from it, abstaining from it, being firm against it. But here Jesus tells us, he informs us that we're supposed to be praying this prayer, and part of our prayer life should be, lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. And this is such an important part of the prayer. In fact, when I pray this prayer, and I pray it often, I don't pray this prayer all the time, emphasizing one thing in my mind only. When I pray this prayer, different things stick out at different times when I pray it. Very often, this part of the prayer stands out when I pray it. When I get to this part of the prayer, you know, lead me not into temptation. Lead us not into temptation. And I pray this prayer not only personally, but I pray it often, you know, with my family or my children if I'm putting them to bed. And, you know, just about every night when I put Josiah to bed because he's the youngest, we pray this prayer together out loud. And it's very, very important prayer. In fact, I believe one of the reasons, by the grace of God, I'm one of those pastors, by the grace of God, who's still standing after so many years, is because of Jesus', Jesus instructions here. And because of his grace in my life and showing me that I need to pray this prayer. I believe the way our fellowship is constructed, the way I won't counsel women alone, the way I made my wife the first secretary of Blessed Hope, and she's still secretary, those are ways that God led me into as a result of praying this prayer. I really believe that. That he led me in certain ways that keep me from falling as a result of praying, lead us not into temptation. And I believe that as you pray this prayer, the same thing will be manifested in your life and has been already if you've been praying this prayer. It covers so many things, right? Give us this day, you know, forgive us our sins, right? Deliver us from evil. Covers the necessities of life, meet our needs. Covers our, our relationship with God, forgive us as we forgive those who sin against us, right? And it covers our being delivered from the evil in this world that wants to just swallow us up and destroy us. Very powerful prayer and so short, so easy to pray. So important. Uh, so I would, I would really encourage, if you don't have this prayer memorized, just open your Bible and begin praying it, you know, at, in the morning when you wake up. Hey, when you wake up in the morning, there's nothing better than putting your hands in the hand of the Lord and letting Him guide you, right? And leading you out of temptation, amen? Leading you triumphantly. And what a good prayer. I, I hope you're not sitting here saying, yeah, I'm here on Sunday, I'm, I love Jesus and so forth. And you're just disregarding this prayer. Oh, I don't really need to do it. I have a pretty strong walk. Because when you, if you're at that point, you're missing the whole point of the prayer is you need God's resources because your flesh is fallen. It's wicked. It's evil. We live in a depraved world that's filled with temptation, and we live with a, a world that's filled with demonic spirits under Satan's control. We live in a fallen realm, and we so need to rely on God's resources and God's strength if we have any hope of victory in this world. It's going to be about his power and him delivering us. And the person who says, I don't really need to pray that I'm such a strong Christian, is already falling as they're thinking that. Because the Bible says, take heed when you stand, lest you what? Lest you fall. It may already be giving in to temptations that they don't even recognize as temptations because the heart could be so hard. And I'm not saying for sure, but could be. You could be in that state. It's so important to pray this prayer and rely upon the Lord God. Now, it's a puzzle, which I mentioned. It is, it is a puzzle. And we need to pray this prayer because I look at this part of the prayer as the, a, a part, it's all about humility in this prayer and recognizing God as hallowed be thy name holy, right? But this prayer underscores the need for humility on our part when we face the wiles of the devil and we face the circumstances in this world. Lead us not into temptation. It shows us, we're basically saying, God, in and of myself, there's no good thing that dwells in my flesh, as Paul said, and I'm not going to have victory in my own strength. I need you. I have to rely on you. It's a prayer of humility, because the Bible says pride goes before a fall, and a haughty spirit goes before destruction. And pride will lead us not to pray because we'll think we have self-sufficiency, that we've got the power that we don't need to. And then all of a sudden we end up falling in areas we don't even recognize we're falling. And then we'll start seeing certain things because we're proud. We won't even see them as sin. And we'll be grieving the Spirit of God. Troy Palamala He's at uh, Star Safety, one of the best safeties in the NFL for years now. I think he came in the NFL around 2003. Uh, he's already got three Pro Bowls, 
not been in the league that long. Just won a Super Bowl with the Pittsburgh Steelers in la uh, this last year. This, you know, 2009, actually. This year, won the Super Bowl. Great safety. You've seen, if you've watched football, you've seen Paul Amala because he's the Samoan guy with uh, the, the, the long locks, you know, Samson kind of look, you know, running around just crazy on the field, you know. Reminds me of another Samoan, Junior Seau, you know, who's more of a, he was a linebacker, but just the way he plays, just all out. Awesome to watch. But it's interesting, an interview he gave right before the Super Bowl, he said, pride is tough. He said, you go to high school and it's pride, courage. It's all these types of words that we use to motivate us. I don't think there's, they're anywhere in Scripture, though. Interesting. He said, where pride, uh, where pride was ever a positive characteristic of anybody, because I don't see it anywhere in Scripture where it's a positive characteristic of anybody. That kind of egotism, he says, is a really tough struggle, especially in this business, in the NFL. It's a big struggle of mine, he says. And he went on to say uh, some of the obvious things, temptations, are not the hardest things in life. It's not the obvious ones that are really hard. He said it's uh, the big things that are the easiest to turn away from. It's the accumulation of small things that are hard. People know adultery is bad. They know murder is bad. I'm not going to go out and sleep with the first girl I see. But when your eyes start wandering, uh, you become a little more jealous and envious, and these passions start rising up inside of you, that's when it really becomes dangerous. He goes on to say, because the devil doesn't work that way. His strategy is always to be very subtle and continue to build on top of the evil seed that he's planted. And Paul Amala says that he keeps rooted in this way. He says, as your prayer life becomes more and more fine-tuned, and your conscience becomes more and more fine-tuned, you're able to start plucking away at these things. You're like, wow, this is not good. And I thought it's interesting that he said he learned discernment as to what was good and evil through his prayer life. Obviously from the Word of God, getting the knowledge of pride and what pride was and how it's not good to be proud and arrogant and egotistical. And, but he, he realized that through praying, he was led or delivered from the subtle deceptions of Satan. So as Troy Palomala, you know, you know, gets victory or uh, enjoys some victory, and God help him to keep praying and seeking God, he recognizes that a lot of that has to do with, with prayer. And it's interesting because that's Jesus' teaching here. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. We're supposed to be praying about being delivered from temptation. Now this is where it's puzzling. And it is puzzling. It's very puzzling prayer because he's pray he says, lead us not into temptation. Now, keep in mind, it's puzzling because of this. Because the Bible says that God tempts no man, neither can he be tempted. So the puzzle starts there. Oh, wait a minute. It says that God tempts no man, neither can he be tempted. So how could God lead us into temptation if he tempts no man? So now you're in this puzzle. So what happens is scholars like to point out, and it's a Greek word I've studied for years off and on, is the Greek word parasmos doesn't always mean temptation, but often means what? Amen, testing. That same Greek word is translated testing throughout the New Testament as it is temptation. So a lot of scholars point out that, hey, Jesus is really saying, you know, lead us not into testing because God would never lead us, would never tempt us. God doesn't tempt anyone, the Bible says. So it's really talking about testing. Lead us not into testing. So they think the riddle there, so to speak, or the puzzle is solved. It's not solved with that. Because the Bible does show us that testing is actually what? For us. Good for us. Amen? Testing can be really good for us. In fact, we learn in Romans chapter 5 and James chapter 1 that God uses testing to strengthen us to build proven character, to show us our weaknesses, our need for His grace, and to show us our need to cry out to Him so we can be strengthened to become men and women of God who are mature. Amen? So we can be transformed from within by His grace. And, and that He uses these things to make us stronger. So, that does not solve the puzzle. Does not solve the puzzle? So what does solve the puzzle? I wish there was an easy, simple answer, but I believe as we ferret this out, and we talk about this, that we'll come to a deeper understanding of what Jesus is saying here and appreciate it more uh, and, and simply leave it to the Lord. Because the Bible says trials, God uses trials. 
they test our faith, it says, for instance, in 1 Peter chapter 1, that our faith may come out as gold. Job said, I know when God's done testing me, I'm going to come out at, like gold, you see? So, you know, God allows tests. We need to be tested here on earth to show whether we're going to follow God or Satan. One or the other. Somebody can't say, oh, well, I'm kind of just neutral. No, Jesus Christ said, who, has, who created the universe, who inspired his word, he said, he that's not with me is against me. That's why the Bible says, choose this day whom you will serve. That's why God says, I put life and death, or life and prosperity before you, and death and adversity, choose life, you and your descendants, and you shall live. He wants us to make choices to serve him, to glorify him, to be in fellowship with him. That's why it's so important to be in fellowship at a, at a good, strong church. That's why it's so important to be in the word of God. That's why it's so important to seek his face. But you see, we're called, though, to pray, Father, lead us not into temptation but deliver us from evil. So what's the answer here? Well, the Greek word parasmos, the Greek word parasmos, which is translated here temptation, as I mentioned, is translated in many places as testing. That's because this particular Greek word, we don't have a great English word to translate that Greek word parasmos. We don't have a great English word. Because when you see that word parasmos in the Greek, and this may help you, usually when you're seeing the word testing in the New Testament or temptation, you're, you're usually seeing the word parasmos. So you can understand when you see temptation or testing that it's like a coin, heads and tails. It's like a coin with two sides. That word can be translated tested, testing, or temptation in most instances in the New Testament when it's used. Now, there's sometimes when it's invariably translated, even though it can be translated another way, temptation or testing, because that seems to make the most sense on the face of it. And often what the Lord is doing is bringing out more of an emphasis on one side of that coin than the other. So that helps us out. So what we need to understand is this. God doesn't tempt any of us. And God uses testing to strengthen us. But, God, but the very testing that God uses to strengthen us, right, and to test us, tempt, Satan uses to what? To solicit us to do evil, to fall. That's his objective. It is never, ever God's objective to make us fall and turn away from him and have, uh, commit apostasy. You see, God doesn't tempt anyone, the scriptures say. So it's true, God doesn't tempt anyone. And when there's a test, God means it for our good, amen? A good verse on this is Genesis chapter 50, verse 20, in, in regard to application. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. That's when Joseph said, uh, what you meant for evil, speaking of his brothers, inspired by the evil one, even as Judah betrayed him, who was a picture of Judas in the New Testament, same name, Hebrew slash Greek in the New Testament, and inspired Satan. What you meant for evil, he said, God meant for what? God meant for good. You see, that's Greek word parasmos all of a sudden becomes very enlightening, you see, because that word shows what Satan's objective, which is to destroy your soul, you know, to have you commit apostasy, to wipe you out, wipe your family out, wipe just like Job, just destroy you. Remember Job? What was Satan's objective? Let me at him. You have a hedge built around Job, God, or Satan says to God, take the hedge down and surely he'll curse you to your face. Job didn't do that. God allowed him. He, allowed, he didn't tempt Job. He allowed Satan to tempt him, but God was on the other side strengthening him, encouraging him to move on. And God was the one, as Job acknowledged, who was making him like gold. You refine gold in the fire. You heat that, that gold up. You try it, you see, and you fire it up, and it melts the impurities out of it, you see. It melts, and the impurities rise to the top, and the, the goldsmith, the Bible uses that picture of the refiner's fire in the Old Testament, where the refiner is sitting over his fire, over the fire as the, as the gold is being melted, and he takes the impurities out of it as they rise to the top until he sees his reflection in that fire, in that gold. God continues to let us go through trials so he could see us like gold and his reflection, us restored to his image from our fallen state. Now, it's interesting because trials reveal what's in us. We get squeezed. The, one of the Greek words for trials is phlipsis, which means originally was, it was translated tribulation often. It meant originally to be crushed between two rocks, to be squeezed, you see. But like toothpaste, when you squeeze it, something comes out, right? Well, you're like, you're like, not toothpaste, but you're like, you get squeezed and what's in you comes out. When you get knocked over, you see who you, who you are. 
You get an accident, you know, some guy hits you after you get angry at you, you know, on purpose. You see who you are inside, you know. Do you plot to slash his tires and murder him, you know? Or do you say, Lord, help me control myself here and help me not make a dumb mistake right here, you know? And who are you yielding to? Your passions and Satan? Or are you p- yielding to the power of God? And you'll fail test and you'll, you'll pass test. But the key is, is that you pass more and more tests as your Christian walk uh, continues. And what, what happens when you tip over... What comes out? Vinegar and a sourness or, or a perfume or cologne, a sweet smell. You know, God is transforming us into his likeness. When Jesus was dealt heaviest blows anybody ever faced, he wasn't sour. He wasn't putrid. He wasn't evil. He prayed, Father, forgive them for they don't know what they do. And he never sinned. And that's what he wants from us. He wants us to walk righteous lives. He calls us to be perfect as your Father in heaven is perfect. He knows that we're not going to be absolutely perfect until he returns. But that's his goal in our lives, that we are perfected. Amen? Now, a cool way to look at this word and how, it's, how God means it for good and Satan means it for evil is turn to James chapter 1. James chapter 1. And when you get there, look at chapter 1 of James, verses 2 and 3. And when you see verses 2 and 3, James actually uses the Greek words parasmos and uh, uh, prasmo, uh, prasmos, the, the, the noun, and, and then the verb, uh, perozo, really, uh, you know, like six different times here in the book of James, chapter 1 alone, in verses 2 and 3. He says, Consider all joy, my brethren, when you encounter various trials. Guess what the Greek word is there? Prasmos. It's translated what? Trials. Knowing that the testing of your faith produces, knowing that the what? Testing of your faith, okay? Again, parasmos, uh, produces endurance. And let endurance have its perfect result so that you may be perfect and complete, lacking in nothing. Amen? There it is. It's used over and over again. Now look at verse 12. Look at verse 12. And we see it again. Blessed is the man who perseveres under trial. Greek word, parasmos. For once he has been approved, he will receive the crown of life which the Lord has promised to those who love him. Wow. There it is again. Verse 13, though. We find it a couple other times. A prosmos, the verb form, parezo, uh, or, or the noun form. Let no one say when he is tempted, okay, I am being tempted by God. Okay, there it's parezo actually twice. Excuse me, parezo, which is the same word as prosmos. It's just a cognate. For God cannot be tempted by evil, and he himself does not what? tempt anyone. Same word. Same word all the way from James chapter 1 verses 2 and 3 to verse 12 to verse 13 to verse 14. Verse 14. Now it's interesting. Let no one say when he's tempted. I'm being tempted by God. God cannot be tempted by evil and he himself does not tempt anyone. But each one is tempted. There's the same Greek word again. When he is carried away and enticed by his own lust. Then when lust has conceived, it gives birth to sin. And when sin is accomplished, it brings forth, to, brings forth death. Do not be deceived, my beloved brethren. And you notice how the translators typically, in almost every translation, translate the words just as we've seen them. Trial and temptation. Even though it's the same Greek word. Because they understand that from God's vantage point, verses 2 and 3, you're rejoicing because what? It's a test. Because with every test, there's also what? A temptation. There's a voice there that says, go this way, take the easy way out, even if it hurts people, even if it hurts your family. But there's God's side, and God's saying, no, endure. I'm going to get you through this. I'm going to make you strong. I'm going to uh, have you be victorious so you can be a man or woman of God. And so you can be a blessing to your family and those around you. You see? So, and so you can be a blessing to God, so you can hallow his name. And it's important to understand this because when you get to verse 14, verse 13 and 14, let no one say, same Greek word, when he is what? Tempted. Because they're understanding that this is the side that God is not after. Satan is the one that tempts us. He's the one that tempts us. Now, it's important to understand that God looks at it from the vantage point. God said, yes, you can do it to Satan. Even in Matthew chapter 4, remember when Jesus was tempted three times by the devil? If you recognize the first couple verses of chapter 4, it says that the Spirit, God's Spirit, led him out to the wilderness to be tempted of the devil. 
Do you understand that? So what's going on there? God's vantage point is it's a test. You might better translate that word tested there, same Greek word, but probably the word test is better. But God is not doing, is he? Who's doing the tempting? Who's trying to get Jesus to fall? Who? Satan. What's, God trying to, what's God's desire for Jesus to do? Stand. In fact, you know why Jesus stood? Well, he's the son of God, number one, amen? But guess what he quoted three different times? Scripture, the word of God. God's vantage point, God's word to make him strong and stand. And he did stand, amen? So in understanding this puzzle, you really need to understand both sides of the Greek word. Not one exclusively or the other exclusively, but understand that there's a nuance here that's important to understand to see God's side and Satan's side. Now, we still need to understand, well, what does it mean then? Lead us not into temptation because God, spirit, by his spirit, led Jesus out to be tested, even though he himself didn't tempt him. His objective was for him to pass that test, and he led him into it, but, not, but he didn't do the tempting. And Jesus, by the way, was victorious, amen? And the God's objective, thank God, he was proven as the second Adam uh, to be the one uh, that would overcome the evil one. Now go to 1 Corinthians chapter 10. We get a little more insight and probably the most popular verse in the New Testament on temptation, but it gives us some insight into this that's so important for us to understand. 1 Corinthians chapter 10. And when you get there, look at verse 12. Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not what? That he does not fall. He's dealing with pride. Let him who thinks he stand, hey, I'm standing in Jesus, man. I'm strong. I'm heaven bound. I know my God and so forth. Ah, well, guess what? Pay attention that you don't fall. Because as Peter says, that Satan goes about as a roaring lion seeking someone to devour. That's his desire. God's desire is in 2 Peter 2, 9, that he knows how to deliver the ungodly. I'm sorry. He knows how to deliver the godly from temptation. He can deliver us. He knows how. But the first thing we need to do is what? Verse 12, Therefore let him who thinks he stands take heed that he does not fall. When I pray and when you pray, Father, lead us not into temptation. What are you doing? You're taking heed when you stand that you don't fall. You're recognizing that you can fall. You're recognizing that you need God's strength so you don't fall. Do you understand that? That's how you obey this verse. One of the ways, I mean, you also strap on the full armor of God that you may stand on the evil day. There's different ways you obey this verse. But you become very acutely aware of your own weakness. God said to Peter and the disciples, pray that you don't enter into temptation. The flesh, the, the, the flesh is weak, right? But the spirit is what? Willing. He lets us know that our weakness, we're prone to falling. Therefore, we need to take heed when we stand lest we fall. And the, the first and most important thing my personal conviction is pray. God, lead us not into temptation. It's so important that those words come from your lips and from your heart throughout the day, I personally believe. And that's one of my main prayers because I don't want to be a casualty. I don't want to uh, cease to glorify God. I don't want to hurt my family. I don't want to hurt my brothers and sisters in, in, in Christ. So it's key to make God's name hallowed in my life that I pray this prayer and recognize that, yeah, I'm human. I'm weak. I could fall just like the next person. And so are you. And it's only when you recognize that that you begin to pray. And you recognize that God is powerful. Amen. He's a creator of the universe. He's omniscient and omnipotent and omnipresent and everything else. But look at verse 13. No temptation has overtaken you, but such as is what? Common to man. Hey, temptation is common. And God is what? Faithful. You don't go through things that other people don't go through. You, you might have weird temptations, but somebody else has those weird temptations somewhere else. And God is what? Faithful. Amen? That's God's objective, to get you through it. Satan will lead you into temptation. God will lead you out of temptation. Do you understand that? God will allow you to have testing, but Satan will try to turn it into a temptation to get you to fall. Who will not allow you to what? It says God will not allow you to be what? Tempted beyond what you are able. That's a promise. That fits with lead us not a temptation. So if you are tempted, God won't allow you to go through more than you can handle. If you can't handle it, it's because you did not rely on God's strength and take his way out. Because it says, but with temptation, he will what? Provide the way of escape also, so that you will be able to endure it. God gives a way of escape. You see, Satan will lead you into temptation. God will lead you out of it. 
The word escape, I've shared this word before with you. It's a cool word, ekbasis. Ek is a preposition which means to emerge from within, to be in something and then to emerge out of it. An ekbasis, and a boss is a trail. An ekbasis is a trail out of something. And it was used in warfare in the first century in the Roman Empire. They would use that word of a mountain pass that was a way of escape when you're in warfare. They would have a way out, an exit strategy. Okay, we're in this situation. Man, this is where we go if the, if the enemy converges on us, you see. God, with each temptation, gives us an ekbasis. Right along with the temptation that Satan is tempting us with, that God allows often. Sometimes he doesn't allow because that prayer is answered by him not even allowing it. But with the temptation, right along with the temptations that you face, you have a what? You have an ekbasis. You have a way of escape. It's important to know that. See how awesome God is? He, he wants you. You can't be strengthened without facing trials in life. If you never work out physically in your life, you're not going to be really strong to face strong situations physically. So it is spiritually. So God uses testings, but he doesn't want us to fall into temptation. That's so important to understand. Which brings us to, which I think really crystallizes this uh, in our minds for us, is Matthew chapter 26, where Jesus was going to the cross, and Peter was being manipulated by Satan. We already know that because Jesus, Satan said uh, through Peter, he said, you won't, he said, never shall you go to the cross. That was Peter speaking, but Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. You see? He was being manipulated, and he was, he was thinking his way was better, and Jesus said, get behind me, Satan. And it's interesting because in Matthew chapter 26, at the Last Supper, before the crucifixion, uh, some interesting things happened. And uh, if you look at verses 33 and 34, something very interesting happens here. But Peter said to him, this is when, you know, Jesus talked about how they would forsake him, they would be scattered. And he said, even though all may fall away, remember this? He said, even though all may fall away because of you, I will never fall away, says Peter. I'm not going to fall away. Now, Paul said, take heed when you stand, lest you what? Fall. Was Peter paying attention that he could fall here? Or was he overconfident? Was he proud? He was proud. He was being arrogant here. Because you know what? Jesus just said, you are going to fall away. Peter's like, even though everybody else falls away, all the other disciples, not me, you know? And he said he's ready to go to prison and death with Jesus if you compare the scriptures. I'm ready to go to prison and death with you. But you know what? Uh, and he goes on to say that in a moment. And Jesus said to him, verse 34, Truly I say to you that this very night before the rooster crows, you will deny me three times. You will deny me three times. See, Peter's already falling. Do you get the point? Because in his heart, he doesn't realize he needs to rely on Jesus. Peter said to him, even if I have to die with you, I will not deny you. All the disciples said the same thing, too. They, that was not good leadership on Peter's part. He just led them into a trap, you see. And now he contradicts Jesus again. He said, you're going to fall? I'm not going to fall. Everybody else may fall. I'm not going to. Uh, this very night, you're going to die me three times before the rooster crows. Even if they all do it, I'm not going to do it. Woo, man. This is Jesus talking to him. And he just thinks he doesn't really need to be concerned about praying and so forth. And, and guess what? That's, this is God's word talking to us. How many of us are like Peter where we're not praying this prayer, where we're not seeking God diligently in this respect, and like Peter, we're falling on our face. And like Peter, we don't even realize we're headed for a fall because it's interesting. Look at verses 39 and 40 now. Same chapter, verses 39 and 40. And he went a little beyond them. This is in the Garden of Gethsemane, the night before the crucifixion. And he went a little beyond them and fell on his face and prayed, saying, My Father, if it's possible, let this cup pass from me, yet not as I will, but as you will. Verse 40, And he came to the disciples. And by the way, isn't it interesting, his prayer? If possible, let this cup pass from me. So he's, he's Jesus is humbly praying, if there's a way to escape this particular trial, let it pass from me. But he says, but not my will, your will be done. In humility, he's recognizing this is a radical trial. He's going to have to bear the sins of the world. But since there's no other way humans can be saved other than Jesus Christ dying on the cross, that's why the Father had him go to the cross still. Because there was no other way. And in verse 40, and he came to the disciples and found them what? Sleeping and said to Peter. I think it's interesting. He said to Peter. Why do you think? 
He says, so you men could not keep watch with me for one hour? He's speaking to all of them, but he's speaking directly to Peter. Looks at Peter when he says it. So, you guys couldn't even pray one hour with me? That's a strong rebuke. Because the Son of God is praying in the Garden of Gethsemane and knows that he needs to pray and rely upon the strength of the Father. Yet Peter and the other sinful disciples think they don't need to pray and they're falling asleep. Who do you think is going to emerge victorious from the Garden of Gethsemane? You know what? Well, look at verse 41. Keep watching and praying that you may not enter into what? Temptation. The spirit is willing, but the flesh is weak. I mean, this is a lot like the prayer he told us to pray. Father, you know, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil. This is a principle that we need to get down if we're going to be strong in our Christian lives. Keep praying. Keep watching. The Greek, it's imperative, present tense, I believe, which means to continue, keep on commanding, imperative. Keep on praying. If they kept falling asleep. And you know what's interesting? And I wish we had time to get into it, but we don't. At the end of this, when the guards come, and they come to arrest Jesus, it's interesting because Jesus says something to them. He says, get up and sleep on. You won't see that in your English translations. The neat thing about, I've, I've got interlinears, I've got uh, Greek text, and a lot of the oldest manuscripts have, get up and sleep on. And it's interesting because it doesn't translate well. It doesn't seem to make a lot of sense. And thank God it wasn't changed in the Greek, even though it didn't make sense and they usually translate it differently. It says, he says literally, get up and sleep on. In other words, guess what? You're going to stay asleep spiritually. Because you slept in the garden, you refused to pray, you didn't obey my word, you think that you've got it together, you're proud and arrogant, thinking you don't need to rely on the Father, but he had to rely on the Father. And what happened? When Jesus prayed, it says an angel came, if you read the whole context, an angel came and strengthened him. Strengthened him. Were the disciples strengthened? No. And what happened? Jesus emerged victorious and died on the cross for our sins, amen? What did the disciples do? They fell radically. They denied the Lord. Peter did it worse. You know what's heavy? Think about it. Now this is where it crystallizes in my mind. Where did Peter end up? Where did Peter end up? He ended up in the courtyard denying the Lord three different times. Even a little girl comes to him and says, were you one of them? Your speech betrays you. You sound like a Galilean. And he starts using foul language denying that he knew Jesus. But guess what? If, if he would have prayed, lead us not into temptation, deliver us from evil, do you think he would have been in that position? You get it? This crystallized in my mind. I don't think he would have been there because God wouldn't have led him into a situation where he knew he would fall. The key is, is God wasn't leading Peter there. Peter led Peter there. You get it? So when you're praying, lead us not into temptation, you're saying, God, keep me from falling don't allow me to wander from you and end up in situations where I'm going to fall. Or if God did lead him there, it would only be because God strengthened him in the garden to where he would have had the power to be victorious or there would have been a way of escape where he didn't have to sin. Are you catching it? So you're basically humbling, saying, God, keep me from situations. I admit I'm, I'm falling where I'm going to fall. And guide me. You get it? I want to say so much more, but I can't because I want to get you. No, I can't. I can't because there's another service coming up, and I'll put that behind. But anyway, I love you guys. It's such an important prayer to pray, and, and you know, we've learned several things here. We've learned that we need God reminds to overcome temptation. God reminds us of our weakness, the fallenness of our flesh, that we need to pray to overcome it, that he is faithful to deliver us, that, that we're not strong in ourselves, that he gives us an boss as a way of escape, that he limits Satan's power to to tempt us, in this case, that he gives us strength to overcome it. There's so many wonderful truths here, and we've learned so many wonderful things from this prayer. Our Father. We've learned that he's our Father because we've been born again through faith in Christ. Amen? And we learn our Father in heaven, that he's in heaven. He's far, but he's near. He's intimate. He's our Father. 
Give us this day our daily bread, that he meets our daily needs, that with the recession and so forth, we rely on him, and he's going to take care of us. He is taking care of this fellowship one way or another. He's given us resources by his grace. Give us this day our daily bread. Amen. Forgive us our debts as we forgive those who sin against us. He teaches us to rely on him for forgiveness. We need it or we're toast in hell forever. But he also teaches us that we need to forgive others, have right relationships with them. Lead us not into temptation. Deliver us from evil. And that's the one part, I just quote this one verse, John 17, 15. Jesus says, I don't pray that thou shouldest take them out of the world, but that thou shouldest deliver them or keep them from the evil one. He wants us to be, he wants to deliver us from the evil one. And he does if we rely on him. And then the doxology, uh, you know, thy kingdom, uh, uh, thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever and ever. Amen. That's not in the oldest manuscripts. That's why it's in brackets in a lot of your Bibles are not there at all because it's not in the oldest manuscripts. Uh, you can still pray it because guess what? It's in Chronicles. In Chronicles, it's biblical still. It's still true. So you, you can still lend your prayer that way. But uh, Jesus didn't give us that part. And it seems like a translators later on wanted there to be an ending, you know, so they used the doxology, which is similar to Chronicles. But it's important for us to pray this prayer. I hope to God that you've been inspired through these messages to pray this prayer more and rely on the Lord. Amen? Otherwise, it's been in vain, and, and it hasn't been in vain of my fault or God's fault or Jesus lacking provision. It's going to be your fault if you don't apply these things. Don't be like Peter and ignore Jesus' instructions to pray because we're weak. We'd be delivered from temptation. Amen? Be like Jesus who walked his talk and emerged victorious. Amen? If you don't know the Lord Jesus Christ, you're not going to have any victory of, over, over temptation until you're saved, until the Holy Spirit lives in you, until Jesus Christ saves you from your sins and can strengthen you from it then, because the Bible says through him we can do all things. Amen? He is our strength. But you need to be saved from the penalty of your sins, so you need to make sure that you're putting your trust in Jesus and that you repented of your sins and your faith is in Jesus Christ. And all you have to do is cry out to him and ask him to come into your life and repent of your sin and become a follower of Jesus Christ. And it's a free gift eternal life because he died on the cross to pay for your sins and rose again and conquered death did, it, did you understand at the end how peter ended up where he would have never ended up if he would have prayed that prayer and that kind of solves the puzzle for us I, we'll, we'll get that into that a little bit more in the next service but you know we got a great family here god's doing wonderful things i you know it's awesome through the years to see people's lives change that just walk in the fellowship and and to see them grow in christ and uh, and just be on fire for Jesus and start their own Bible studies with friends and things like that. It's been exciting to see. Uh, things are getting hotter, but the cool thing is, is this is when God shows up. It's when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego were in the fiery furnace, right? Where Nebuchadnezzar said, who's that fourth one? I didn't put him in there. And that was the Son of Man, Jesus Christ, the Son of God. And when things get hotter for us, Jesus shows up. Jesus showed up to John in the Isle of Patmos when he was sent there in exile, right? So when things go down, pray, God, lead us not in temptation, deliver us from evil, and seek him and, and develop intimacy with your creator, amen? Get to know him better. And that's the most beautiful reward in testing, to know God more, amen? Father, we thank you for the cup and the bread. We thank you for the bread, which represents your son's body. Because, Father, we have fallen into temptation and we've sinned. And we haven't given you our whole heart at all times. Far from it, Father. We've fallen radically short of your glory. But we thank you, Father, that you've rectified that situation as well. That you sent your Son to die in our place to save us from our sins and to deliver us from evil. Father, we thank you for the bread which is unleavened and represents your Son's body, which was given for us, the bread from heaven, his body on the cross, so we can have eternal life. We partake of it with thanksgiving in Jesus' name. Father, we thank you for the cup. We partake of it in reminder and sweet reminiscence of the Son who shed his blood as it represents his blood. He poured out for us so we didn't have to die because of our sins. In Jesus' name, amen. One more very, 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 very important announcement, just let you know, is uh, there are some people... Here in any fellowship, you have people with different sicknesses. And as our fellowship and some of us get older, in fact, I just had somebody come in a few weeks ago and they love the fellowship. They say, but, you're, but it's too young. There's too many young people here. I thought, I thought we were getting older here, you know. Uh, but we're getting older as a fellowship and we're going to see more sickness because that's just the part of our fallen bodies, you know. 
and we need to pray for sicknesses more and I think that's something I try to always keep in the forefront uh, with you but there's a few people you know with cancer there's a few people uh, with other lupus you know two or a couple people with lupus which can be a serious disease when it's manifested you know other diseases and sicknesses as well and what I want to do is have a, a, a day of fasting for them you know so Tuesday evening Tuesday evening sometime in the evening or sometime during the day just try to make it like a 24-hour fast I like to sometimes start like a Jewish fast as the Sun goes down and then not eat until the Sun goes down the next day or you say but I've got a dinner right when this you know at 730 that that's fine then maybe start it at 9 or whatever or maybe you don't have a dinner do it whenever you want but try to go 24 hours then the next day you can drink water but don't, don't say, yeah, I'm just going to do a juice fast. And, oh, I'm going to put some vanilla ice cream in the blender. And I'm going to sherbet. And that's not fasting, okay? That's fattening, okay? So uh, do, do a water. Just water is plenty, you know? Jesus fasted for 40 days, and so did others, okay? One day is really nothing. So unless you've got some kind of health problem, you know? But then you can fast in other ways. You know, you can keep, you say, I'm not going to do this for a day or whatever, you know? But just, and then... Wednesday night after Bible study, uh, we'll, we'll break our fast. So you might start later Wednesday evening, like say 9 o'clock or 8.30 or whatever on Tuesday and then go to Wednesday evening. And at that time, throughout the time when you're fasting, whenever you get a craving to eat, they say, oh, what a good reminder. And the enemy says, you're hungry, aren't you? Remember he said you could do that ice cream? He didn't say that. And you're going back and forth, you know. Uh, then you could go at that point and say, you know what? I thank you for reminding me. Well, don't thank him, but say, mm, that reminds me to pray, you know. And just begin praying. And take time out to seek the Lord that you'd be spending eating in certain ways. Amen? So let's pray and fast. Let's pray and fast first and foremost. Uh, those who are sick among us, those who are spiritually need strength. Amen? Uh, the situation in our fellowship, and not just our church, but for other fellowships. A lot of fellowships are getting squeezed right now. That's when we find what's in us. Let Jesus rise to the top. Amen? Let's let him rise to the top. Let's go find him. Praise God. Give him glory. Father, we love you. We praise you. We worship you. We exalt you. We honor you. You are worthy. You are to be hallowed. May your name be hallowed in our lives. Hallowed be your name. Let's pray that prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come. Your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our sins as we forgive those who sin against us. Lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. Give somebody a big hug. God bless you guys. Have a beautiful day. We want to thank you for joining us today at Blessed Hope Chapel. We hope you're edified by the service. Uh, our main hope and prayer for you is that you would know the Lord Jesus Christ, that you would have eternal life. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father but through me. He said, I have come that you might have life more abundantly, but the thief comes to steal, kill, and destroy. Jesus said, enter the straight gate, for broad and spacious is the way that leads to destruction, and many go that way. But straight and narrow is the way that leads to life, and few are those who find it. Our hope and prayer is that you'd be among those who find it, that you'd find eternal life in Jesus Christ. We thank you again for joining us. Have a beautiful week. God bless you. Till next time.